Okay. يلا هاي السلام عليكم ورحمة الله. We're gonna talk about bronchopulmonary dysplasia or chronic lung disease of prematurity. Today we're gonna discuss about the definition, the old and new bronchopulmonary dysplasia, lung development, pathophysiology, and then management approach, final long-term outcomes. I have no financial disclosure. Okay, before uh, we start bronchopulmonary dysplasia, there's some terminology. It should be every one of us aware of those terminology, uh, especially low birth weight baby, any baby less than 200 uh, or 2,500 gram uh, or, uh, or 2.5 or 2,500. Um, extremely low birth weight baby, if I'm going to elbow baby, that means any baby less than 1,000 uh, gram or one kilogram. A very low birth weight baby, any baby less than 1,500 grams. An extreme premature baby, any baby less than 28 uh, week gestation. And then a late preterm baby from 34 to 37 weeks. So a low birth weight baby less than 2.5. Elbow baby less than one kilo, late preterm baby 34 to 37, and extremely premature baby, any baby less than 28 week gestation. Bronchopulmonary dysplasia, uh, what's the difference between chronic lung disease or bronchopulmonary dysplasia? Bronchopulmonary dysplasia is chronic lung disease of prematurity. If the chronic lung disease is related to the prematurity, they call it bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Um, so it's a condition of chronic lung disease due to disruption and injury of the pulmonary vascular development affecting primary, the premature infant. It can also affect the full-term baby who is, or the full-term baby due to lung, acute lung injury, like the pragmatic okay. hernia, pneumonia, meconium aspiration syndrome. Okay. The definition of bronchopulmonary dysplasia, what basically any baby required oxygen at certain point of time frame, they called bronchopulmonary dysplasia. The exact definition is being changing and until this time, there is no clear definition of chronic uh, or bronchopulmonary dysplasia or through definition of bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Uh, there, is, there is no clear definition that uh, silently and uh, or uh, Faisal. Allah, how will you aim that you work it for three of us? So definition is changing. The reason why it's changing because uh, it does not truly reflect a long-term outcome. So in 1979, by the NIH workshop, uh, the Amal Libya, hello, uh, Samah, silent. Or mute Amal Libya. Binisbali, Dr. Banklari had from Miami University. He defined chronic lung disease any baby requires oxygen during the first 28 days of life, in addition with the clinical and radiological finding. Any fair history of prematurity? Radiological changes and baby on oxygen when he reached 28 days of life that's used to called chronic lung disease that's changing by the time as you can see from 1979 to the 88 by dr channel he de defined chronic lung disease just at 36 
we corrected. So you have to wait until 36 weeks to call chronic lung disease, regardless of the clinical manifestation. And that was not right. And then the changing, the definition changing 2001, and that's most popular used, widely used now in ICDH by 2001. They defined, they defined the chronic lung disease um, based on gestational age. If you are less than 32 week gestation or you are more than 32 week gestation started. So if you have your baby born below 32 weeks gestation, you have to wait until complete 36 week corrected gestation. If baby at the 32 week corrected required oxygen, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm wrong, sorry. Uh, opposite. Let me change it. Sorry. So if you have baby less than 32 weeks, small, tiny baby, less than 32 week gestation, you have to wait until corrected 36 weeks. If the baby at 36 weeks still required oxygen support, in addition to the clinical and radiological changes, that's we call chronic lung disease or bronchopulmonary dysplasia or prematurity. If baby older than he born after 32 week gestation. Then if baby required oxygen the first 28 days of life, they called chronic lung disease. So did he, he did split based on gestation. The reason why a lot of baby, especially tiny baby less than 32 weeks, most, a lot of places they leave the baby on CBAB or respiratory support till 32 week. And usually they sometimes, especially if you have 22 weeks or 23 um, weeks or 24 weeks, if you leave them until 32 weeks, that's more than 28 days of life. That's why they, they divide it to that less than 32 weeks, more than 32 weeks corrected. And you can see here, less than 32 weeks, more than 32 weeks. If baby less than 32 weeks, you have to wait time frame 36 week corrected or baby discharge home whenever comes first. If the baby older than 32 weeks started at birth, you have to wait the first 28 days. If baby required any respiratory support, especially oxygen here, the definition 2001, okay? Uh, required oxygen at 28 days of life, but less than 50 days post gestational age or discharge home whenever comes first, they called chronic lung disease. They further depend on the Severity, they classify to the mild, moderate, severe chronic lung disease or bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Mild, he required respiratory support and remain in room air. Moderate, need oxygen less than 30%. Severe, who need more than 30%. And that's the 2001. There's a lot of issue with the 2001 from the NICH. Number one, a lot of babies at corrected 36 weeks, usually they require nasal cannula. And here by the definition, it's not clear. This one also does not exactly reflect a long-term outcome. And type of oxygen, the difference. So his heterogeneity of the oxygen. So there's a lot of question mark about this definition. Yes, 2016, they did revise of the definition. They left the same definition less than 32 weeks or more than 32 weeks. If the less than 32 weeks, you have to wait until corrected 36 week gestation corrected. If baby required respiratory support, especially oxygen, they called uh, bronchopulmonary dysplasia. If baby older than 32 weeks at birth or equal or older, you have to wait for 28 days to define. But the, the stages of the disease is classified based on the whether baby required a nasal cannula, high flow, that's the low flow nasal cannula, high flow nasal cannula, nasal CBAB or non-invasive, invasive. So my degree, Either he's on the non-invasive, CBAB or an IV, room air, or if he required nasal cannula from one to two liter, you called mild if he's less than 30%. 
if baby on the low flow nasal cannula, less than one liter, that means it's 100% oxygen, but exactly if you measure it, usually from 22 to 70%, they called mild. So any baby usually required high flow nasal cannula or NIV, if high flow nasal cannula, less than three liter, required less than 30%, they called mild. If the baby NIV or the CBAB required just room air, at the 36 week corrected, they called mild. So either one. And that's you guys, I don't want you guys to remember this. It's not, no one used it like mild, moderate, severe, even they use, they have to look, nobody remembered. So what I need you guys to remember is that 32 weeks corrected, more than 32 weeks, you have to wait for that 36 day uh, week corrected or 28 days of life to call it chronic lung disease, okay? So I don't wanna spend a lot of time because it's, the, it's hard to memorize. And, uh, and nobody used as clinical values, just like the for charting purposes. So let's go to the lung development. Um, lung development, as we know, it's divided to the five stages. We have embryonic phase in the first eight weeks. We have zooglandular, canalicular stage, secular stage, and alveolar stage. We will start here. We said histologically, or the blood vessel, the respiratory system, divided to the conductive airway and or um, respiratory zone. Conductive zone, respiratory zone. We said the difference between conductive zone versus respiratory zone, conductive zone does not participate in gas exchange. What's the conductive zone? You have the bronchi, bronchioles, terminal bronchioles. The respiratory zones, which is involved in the gas exchange, we have the respiratory bronchioles, we have alveolar duct, and then we have the alveoli. We said anatomical, the conductive zone is supplied by the torus aorta versus the pulmonary zone supplied by the pulmonary circulation. Okay. We also said long time ago when we discussed about the respiratory uh, distress syndrome, we said that at the around beginning of the four week gestation, there, there is the, the, um, the respiratory lung development start from the foregut of the pharynx. by having the diverticulum, small like NU2. This diverticulum increased and then form the tracheal bud. And then slowly there is tracheoesophageal membrane or septum split the esophagus in the dorsal part and the trach in the ventral part. If there is any defect on the tracheoesophageal septum, that's what end up tracheoesophageal fistula. So if you have the absence of the septum, or if there's hole in the septum, that's when you have the tracheoesophageal fistula. That's very important. And that's happened where? In the embryonic phase. After that, we have the pseudoglandular. The most critical phase of lung development is the canalicular. That's the board question. The most critical time of the lung development is the canalicular phase. And that's when bronchopulmonary dysplasia, the new version or the new type appear here. Also in this paragraph, that's why I love this uh, diagram, you can see the surfactant. Surfactant starts early production. And, and you have two issue with surfactant, either number or function. Fully surfactant function, usually around 36 weeks. But even 36 weeks, you might have baby with RDS symptoms. The reason why, maybe they have fewer surfactant than normal. But function, it should be mature enough, okay? There is YouTube, uh, you can guys click on it uh, or you can copy this one. If you guys need more three dimension lung development, um, you can click on the YouTube and you can watch the lung development uh, on the three dimension. I have here uh, each zone, what's the disease related or what's the pathological related. We said in embryonic, 
you might have tracheostial fistula, tracheal stenosis, laryngeal cleft, and that's a broad question, by the way. Um, Zodoclandular, more when you have it, the bronchogenic cyst, congenital lobar emphysema, diaphragmatic hernia, cystic adenomatous malformation, or they call it CBAM or CCAM. And then canalicular phase, why is critical canalicular phase phase? Because the nemocyst at this time, the nemocyst type two convert or give you the origin of the nemocyst type one. So type one come from where? Come from the type two. And type, type one is the, when the squamous, it's squamous epithelium and important for gas exchange. Okay. So we said there is old BBD and the new BBD. Why they called old? The origin of the history. Long time ago, we don't have the advanced technology. We don't have the medication that they give to that. We will go through in details. So the first described bronchopulmonary dysplasia why by the Norway in the 1967. What he discovered, babies, they born premature, usually less than 30, uh, older than 32 weeks at a time, with severe respiratory symptoms, required higher oxygen. They have abnormal, ugly look X-ray, and usually those remain on the long time on the mechanical ventilations. And that's the typical feature of the RDS, uh, of the bronchopulmonary dysplasia. So the old bronchopulmonary dysplasia usually happen when we're already the lung structure is already formed. So what happens? It's happen damage to the lung structures. Versus the with the old technology, we start resuscitate even younger babies. We start seeing a different pathology. That's why they call it new bronchopulmonary dysplasia because it appears at the early secular phase and canalicular stage. Do you guys know in some centers, they resuscitate even 21 week. Most of the centers, they resuscitate 22 to 23 weeks, but there are some centers they move even to the 21 week station. So that's early in the canalicular stage. And that's when you have the developmental arrest or delay. And that's when you see the new phase of the bronchopulmonary dysplasia. So the old bronchopulmonary dysplasia, because at the time there's no surfactant, there's no steroids, uh, it's the mechanical ventilation, the in mandatory mechanical ventilation is not synchronized. Usually there's a stat older babies, 32 and above. And that's when you have already the lung is already structured. So when you have the damage in the lung structure, inflammatory markers, hypertrophy, um, necrosis, hemorrhage spots, that they called old bronchopulmonary dysplasia. With the new technology, like the uh, availability of the uh, good antenatal steroids, antenatal care, antenatal steroids, you have the surfactant available, mechanical ventilation, which is the gentle mode of mechanical ventilation, non-invasive, more than invasive, you can see more a risk in the lung development and the new bronchopulmonary dysplasia. So what's the pathophysiology of the bronchopulmonary dysplasia? Number one, you have prenatal or antenatal postnatal factors that contributed to that. So if there's no perinatal care, mom, I, baby, IUGR, mom smoke, um, Choreomonitis, although the, the correlation is not clear. Um, preeclampsia, that's perinatal factors. Postnatal, either infection, uh, no surfactants, um, mechanical ventilation, immediately intubated, but maybe on ventilation instead of the non invasive. So that's number one. Create bro inflammations, and then you put the baby on oxygen. Oxygen, we discussed about the last lecture and the last lecture before, reduce free radicals. 
and that's the cause free radical damage and oxidative stress. They already on mechanical ventilation, that's mechanical damage. All these is going to end up imbalance of the protease and antiprotease, an imbalance between oxidation and antioxidant, and the end result is chronic or bronchopulmonary changes. So back to the factors of the bronchopulmonary dysplasia, prenatal factors, IUGR, that's proven as a factor, lack maternal steroids, or antenatal corticosteroid use. Choriumenitis, although it's mentioned as a factor, but the link, there's no clear link between maternal choriumenitis and bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Until this time, there's no clear evidence support that maternal choriumenitis cause bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Smoke, preeclampsia. Also, although genetic predisposing is considered factor, but when they did genome-wide study, they include almost 900 cases uh, of bronchopulmonary. None of them has any single nucleotide polymorphism identified in all cases of bronchopulmonary dysplasia. So there's no clear link between bronchopulmonary dysplasia and genetic. At birth, if you have low birth weight baby, male gender, the most, the most important risk factor for bronchopulmonary dysplasia, and that's also a board question, prematurity. Okay. The other causes we already mentioned, the mechanical ventilation. BDA also, although it mentioned a risk, but uncertain about the clear link between the BDA. There is no clear evidence support that BDA can cause bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Sepsis, yes, there is evidence. Reflux, there is no evidence uh, unless there is microaspiration. Postnatal uh, growth restriction also uh, implement to the chronic lung disease or considered as a risk factor. So what's the infection, the most common or the highest risk of developed bronchopulmonary dysplasia and that's the board question, candida. So the center, they have high candida rate. Usually, they start prophylactic. Any babies, premature, less than 32 weeks gestation, usually they start baby on the prophylactic fluconazole. And when I did my training, it's all babies on the fluconazole prophylactic. If you are in the center that candida is very, very, very low, then you don't need to start the prophylactic. In my now, my center, we don't routinely put baby on the fluconazole prophylactic because the, the incidence is almost very, very, very low. So that's why. But the is, candidemia is considered the highest risk of developing bronchopulmonary dysplasia. The second, the uroblasma. Uroblasma has been reported to cause bronchopulmonary dysplasia as a the result of dysregulation, inflammatory response, and impaired the lung development. So cases of bronchopulmonary dysplasia, they found there is link between bronchopulmonary dysplasia and uroblasma, uh, uroblasma ureticum. And that's another board question. So we said the prematurity is the main risk factors. Antenatal factor, we discussed about those. Postnatal factor, we discussed all these altered growth factor signal, oxidative stress, release free radicals from the oxygen, and increase the extracellular matrix remodeling and everything what's caused, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, which is impaired alveolization and vascularization, abnormal pulmonary repair and remodeling, and that's end up BBHN or pulmonary hypertension, impaired pulmonary immune function. That's the picture of the pre-surfactant era. So that's before surfactant time. Usually we said more than 32 weeks or more than 30 weeks gestation. As you can see in the X-ray, it's, it's very ugly X-ray. There is areas of atelectasis, area of the, area of the um, hyper expansion. And you can see multiple also, you can see there is blips here, black dots. 
you can see black dots here. That's called PIE or pulmonary interstitial emphysema. And that's reflect how damaged or how bad the alveoli. So with the mechanical ventilation stretching of the alveoli, what happens, the alveoli, it has a leak because of the rupture of the wall of the alveoli, it become leaky and the air starts to escape. Instead of absorb it, starts to escape outside in the parenchyma. And that's when you see that, that's another alveoli here. So that's when you see the PIE or pulmonary interstitial emphysema, which is the air around inside the interstitium, around the alveoli or the intra in interstitium. So all or classical PIE, prolonged mechanical ventilation, oxygen therapy, baby presented with severe respiratory failure, hypoxemia, hypercabinia or respiratory acidosis. And sometimes also they have corbalmonal. When you do X-ray, it's typical finding of the fibrosis collapse, hyperinflated mixing, ugly X-ray. And that's typical, the old picture of the bronchopulmonary dysplasia or the classical, uh, when the Norway described it, that's when he described the bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Versus the new bronchopulmonary dysplasia, it's the difference, it's more homogeneous. Okay, that's the post era or surfactant era. Usually tiny baby, smaller, less than 28 weeks. We are talking about even way more than uh, less than 28 weeks. Usually we are talking about 23, 24, uh, 25 weeks. Majority um, of cases that we see of uh, chronic lung disease usually around less than 25 weeks corrected. Um, and instead of mechanical ventilations, uh, you might be baby on the non-invasive or mechanical ventilation with low pressure and FIO2. Usually they are milder respiratory failure. And the X-ray, you can see the views hazy with hyper expansion. How we know it's hyper expansion? Flat diaphragm, usually more flat like this. Hyper expansion, that means more than 10 reps when you count the reps. And that's the indicate. So more than 10 reps. The diaphragm it's, or the reps it's, itself, it's become more flat instead of like this. So that's indicate hyper expansion. And that's the typical of the new bronchopulmonary dysplasia, the X-ray, and also pathological difference on the bro, uh, in the uh, bre or the new versus the old bronchopulmonary dysplasia. What histological finding looks like? We discussed very quick. You will see some fibrosis, some cystic changes, uh, necrotizing bronchiolitis because of the damage, uh, hypertrophy of the smooth muscles, and uh, pulmonary artery muscularization and pulmonary hypertension. Versus in the new BBD or bronchopulmonary dysplasia, that's the normal, that's the bronchopulmonary dysplasia. You will see the decreased septation. If those septation you can see is less and thinner than here, you can see septation is multiple. You can see wider, fewer septation because they're rested. So you have fewer or decreased septation and alveolar hypoplasia, fewer but larger alveoli. This is regulation of the pulmonary vasculatures, development, disruption of the alveolar capillaries, increase elastic tissue formation. That's very important. Increase elastic tissue formation and thickening of the interstitium as well. So you can see the difference between this X-ray, this fibrosis, hypertrophy, inflammatory markers, you can see all those inflammatory markers versus less inflammatory markers, more it's just septation, less septation, wide gap. And that's the board cushion, by the way. Uh, decreased septation and alveolar hypoplasia and increased elastic tissue formation, those board cushion for who uh, apply for the uh, neonatology board uh, exam. Sometimes we have, we said we have the old that we don't see it as often. We have the new, but sometimes there's overlapping. That means still around 36% of cases we see 
it's the mixed and we see a little bit of the old BBD. The reason why, because those baby is usually more old, like younger, tinier, 22, 23 weaker, who required um, a lot of fluid, who required uh, mechanical ventilation. He start very, um, especially if there is no perinatal care, mom, she did not get steroids, uh, despite uh, surfactant being given, but still, doesn't mean we did not, we, can, uh, we never see the old BBD. We still, there is percentage of the babies, we still see the old chronic pulmonary dysplasia changes on the lung. Okay? Bronchopulmonary risk prediction. There is a couple of the uh, modules that give us prediction of the, when they call us for perinatal care, Usually when we have the baby that expected, or the mom, she's expected to have a baby, a premature 23, 24 week or 25 weeker, if they, or if the baby born already, and you know, you want to know the prediction of the, what's the most likely this baby is gonna be based on the parameters. The most commonly used, it's the NICDH um, calculator. Uh, that's the link. Uh, you can go through this link and you can have this exactly. You're going to have this. And then you can put the how many we gestation your baby. What's the weight of your baby? The sex, uh, race, and ethnicity. And then how old the baby, uh, what type of mechanical ventilation, how much oxygen. And then you click on the calculators. That's, I bought the numbers just to show you guys how it looks like. So I bought the 23 weaker, 600 gram, male, uh, white and the baby was on mechanical ventilation. I did around 30% uh, percent on oxygen and based <clears throat> or 40% percent of oxygen, mechanical ventilation, and I bought the day three of life. Based on those numbers, the mortality rate is around 42%. Percent. Baby, this or my baby, he might develop severe bronchopulmonary dysplasia around 29%, percent, moderate around 19% percent or 18%, percent, mild around 9%. Percent. No, it's very low. So you know, uh, is that very accurate? They said this is the most accurate that we have right now. Um, that's the best what we have right now. It's not 100%, but that's what we have, and that's the best prediction, okay, of the bronchopulmonary dysplasia or chronic lung disease of prematurity. That's what we said. When we say bronchopulmonary disease, that means chronic lung disease of prematurity. That's most likely, okay? Then we're going to discuss about now the preventive strategy. A lot of these uh, prevention, we already discussed on the RDS, on mechanical ventilations, invasive, non-invasive, but just we're gonna go over and just for those who never attend my lectures and revision or they, they just um, train our memory for those who attend uh, my lecture before. So the preventive strategy, we said there's something we can handle, we can do. Number one, prenatal care. If we have very good prenatal center that they take care of the mom, and we have a good prediction if the mom, she's gonna be premature or no. And then if they, um, Alhamdulillah, in Libya, there is no smoke, lady smoke, so that's the part, Alhamdulillah, we don't have to deal with it a lot. Uh, but at least break lamps, say you can control blood pressure. If the baby IUGR or expected baby IUGR, you can treat the underlying cause. Um, the, if the mom, close or if close to have uh, like start premature contractions or there's expectation she might deliver, then st uh, provide the antenatal steroids. Um, those, if the mom, she's infection or have a symptoms of chorionitis treated, although we said is uh, unreliable, uh, uncertain, um, there's no clear data evidence uh, support that chorionitis uh, cause bronchopulmonary dysplasia. But when we take all these parameters, we fix it. Um, for the brain, we give magnesium sulfate uh, as a neuroprotection. So those all, you, we do what we can do to prevent chronic lung disease. So that's number one. And then we will come to this slide later on. And then, so we said bronchopulmonary dysplasia pr prevention, number one, antenatal. We discussed about the points. Already we mentioned steroids. Manage maternal hypertension. If there's any infection. Magnesium sulfate is premature. As a neuroprotection. Postnatal. 
what's the most common we said in the postnatal some people they look at the delivery even below the be, before even or during the delay cord clamp which is not evidence based yet is not approved the deliver or provide non invasive so you you try to recruit the alveoli as early as possible so number 1 you do your best you place baby on cbab either during the delay cord clamp or if your center based on which center what you do in your center see what's your center policies so if you don't have this option then after baby born immediately when the baby come to you in the uh, ready warmer place baby on the cbab Okay, and then we discuss about rescue surfactant. Rescue dose of surfactant. That means a baby, especially in the first two hours of life, that's the best if you're gonna, if your baby required higher oxygen and short respiratory symptoms in the first two hours of life, that's the best time to give surfactant if your baby needed. If your baby already intubated at the delivery room, take opportunity and give your baby surfactant because we know this baby might have, or most likely have surfactant deficiency. And then the third, if your baby, or before that, caffeine. We give caffeine usually all premature baby less than 32 weeks, we place them routinely on caffeine. Why? For apnea of prematurity. But caffeine not only for apnea of prematurity, also prevent bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Also, okay, also, Caffeine improve the neurodevelopmental outcome. Sorry. What else? So we says non-invasive, you place surfactant, you place baby on caffeine, and then if your baby required intubation, we said we're going to use volume mode than the pressure mode because we have the evidence and we will go over it. So that's all prevention. My goal to prevent chronic lung. What else? Fluid management. Although there is no clear study or no clear evidence that fluid prevent bronchopulmonary, but most of the literature most of the uh, policies, they recommend fluid restriction in order to prevent chronic lung disease. When we said fluid restriction in the 130 to 150 it, to prevent chronic lung disease after two weeks of age. Okay, so let's go. So preventive medicine, we, uh, measurement for bronchopulmonary dysplasia, we said steroid decreased the risk of the RDS and neonatal death by 50 percent but it's very important and that's another board question steroid does not decrease bronchopulmonary dysplasia decrease mortality yes decrease the respiratory distress syndrome yes but does not does not prevent or decrease bronchopulmonary dysplasia caffeine we mentioned decrease bronchopulmonary dysplasia decrease days on mechanical ventilation and neurodevelopmental outcome vitamin a and by the way there's only the only two medication that's been proven to decrease bronchopulmonary dysplasia and widely used without adverse significant adverse outcome vit caffeine and vitamin a that's another board question okay so vitamin A, it's required for the growth and we know it's very important for the growth and maturity of the epithelial cell and repair. There's large multi-trial or multi-center trial in 1999 conclude that intramuscular IM 
injection in the first four weeks of age of vitamin A reduce rate of death or BBD and BBD alone. So either alone or combined on those survivors. In the last few years, vitamin D uh, or in America or the United States, there is nationwide shortage of vitamin A. People, what they discover that Despite the nationwide shortage of vitamin A, the rate of the chronic lung disease or the incidence of the chronic lung disease does not change or does not increase. Okay, so they used to give vitamin A and then they did, because of short nationwide shortage, they stopped giving the vitamin A and they found the result is the same. And that's the open very uh, question mark about vitamin A. And now there's ongoing randomized control trials to investigate the enteral vitamin A for bronchopulmonary dysplasia in order to resolve the conflict. If you have it in your center, I recommend to give it. Okay. People do look at the azithromycin because we know that azithromycin can treat the uroblasma. In very, very mature infant, infection with uroblasma, we see it associated with bronchopulmonary dysplasia. This multi-analysis study found that reduction in the risk of bronchopulmonary dysplasia combined with DIT or alone in those infants treated with azithromycin, azithromycin, regardless whether they have uroblasma or no. So they just treat babies with bronchopulmonary dysplasia or early before even bronchopulmonary at risk, those at risk bronchopulmonary, baby have RDS, premature babies. But this study have low evidence, quality of living. There's a lot of question mark about this meta-analysis studies that they are looked for. For that reason, it's not recommended as a routine. And I don't know any center that they give azithromycin as a routine for just uh, to prevent bronchopulmonary dysplasia. If you are suspected that there might be baby have infection and uroblasma, then yes, you have to give it, okay? The trials also evaluate the other macrolide groups like erythromycin and does not show benefits of preventing bronchopulmonary dysplasia. For that reason, large trials are needed to establish the safety and efficiency of prophylactic azithromycin before become recommended. Just to refresh, what's the concern of giving erythromycin in premature bay or in the newborn age group? Yes, I can hear a couple of erythromycin, increased risk of pyloric, hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. So the only few conditions that we give erythromycin in the NICU, okay? We discussed about this. We're going to go over very quick about respiratory support strategy to prevent bronchopulmonary dysplasia. We said CBAB. There are several studies, systemic review studies show that CBAB is more effective with lower mortality and reduced bronchopulmonary dysplasia compared with intubation place baby on mechanical ventilation or compared with the insured trials, which is intubation, gives surfactant extubation. So people, it's more, so CBAB can reduce the mortality and decrease bronchopulmonary dysplasia compared with mechanical ventilation. That's number one. As effective as the insured trial and I consider as alternative. That's why most of the centers now, they place baby on the CBAB and they wait for baby if he shows symptom of the art surfactant deficiency, then they use surfactant as a rescue instead of intubating the baby and expose the baby of the risk of intubation. Non-invasive versus CBAP. Cochrane meta analysis study compared both of them, the non-invasive, which is mechanical ventilation given through the nose, that's we decided, CBAP. They found it, both of them are the, the, there's no difference on chronic lung disease mortality 
But NIV reduce the incidence of the extubation failure. What does it mean? If you have a baby who tiny, tiny baby, you want to extubate the baby. If you want to ex successfully extubate without reintubate, you rather base the baby on the NIV than CBAP. Again, let me out the question if I'm right. If a premature baby, 23 weeker, 24 weeker, 25 weeker, 26 weeker, phlebia, 28 weeker, and you're concerned about this baby might fail CBAP, and because in Libya we don't have caffeine, then you rather place the baby on the NIBBV, non-invasive post pressure ventilation, than CBAP. At least you provide breath, it's considered as stimulation, stimulants. We discussed in the last lecture in non-invasive, we have something called synchronized non-invasive. Particularly when used after extubation may reduce bronchopulmonary dysplasia risk, but further research needed. And that's about synchronized the NOVA. That's we talk about it. The nasal, uh, the esophageal probe that the measure or the sensor of the esophageal contractions. If your baby already intubated for any reason, respiratory failure, baby failed, you give him surfactant, baby is not improved, worsening hypercapnia or respiratory acidosis. Whenever the reason you decided to, multiple apnea, you decide to intubate the baby. What's the mode that we decided to use in tiny babies or small babies? The volume target ventilation. 2017, Cochrane trials, they support use volume versus pressure limit. Because the volume reduced the combined outcome of the death and bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Decreased incidence of the pneumothorax, hypocardia. Duration of the ventilations and IVH, especially the severe type grade three and grade four IVH. And that's we already discussed. So if you have an option, choose the volume over pressure. We said the only those exceptions when you have a big leak that you cannot change the tube or you don't want to re-traumatize the baby, then you can use, you, if you have more than 60% on the volume leak, then you rather switch them to the volume on to the pressure limit. And that's the, exception that you need to use it. Otherwise, use always volume target ventilation. Why? Because you're going to reduce risk with using the volume target. You're going to have less barotrauma, less likely to have pneumothorax, less likely to have the hypocarbia, less duration on the ventilation, and less likely to have the severe IVH, grade three or four. We discussed about the surfactant, systemic review study comparing surfactant administration to the insure versus just place baby on CBAP and show the baby on place on CBAP at lower risk of the chronic lung disease or death. Also, we said the best time if you're gonna give surfactant is the first two hours of life. Doesn't mean you cannot give after, but that's the best time. The rescue surfactant administration premature who receiving mechanical ventilation within first two hours of life compared with after second hour of age, reduce the risk of the bronchopulmonary dysplasia and combined death slash bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Also, we cover the LISA or MIST, which is less invasive surfactant administration. If you have a baby who had it widely used in Europe, who now start increased number in United States under big trials. They use the, uh, in the United States, they call minimal invasive surfactant administration. They use the angiocatheter. Um, in some center, they use the UVC. In the UK, uh, not Germany or Europe, they use the uh, LISA catheter, which is the feeding tube, but is the uh, manufacturer called LISA catheter, which is just for the surfactant administration. It's tiny catheter, 
we said that instead of the intubate the baby, you don't have to stress the baby, you don't have to block the whole airway. It's small angiocatheter or the feeding or the Lisa catheter go through the baby still um, the airway is not completely blocked you give surfactant you pull it out and baby still remain on the CBAP so you still recruit the all alveoli and baby will get the benefit of CBAP that's called uh, this uh, strategy it's promising uh, there is meta-analysis study although the quality of evidence still low and there is uh, because um, and the serious risk of the bias but now there is a big study is going on hopefully we can give more answers uh, sh but almost all those is show promising, decreased risk of the bronchopulmonary dysplasia, death, IVH grade three, four, and pneumothorax compared with the insured trials. When we said insured trial, that means you intubate the baby, extubate. So you intubate the baby, you give surfactant, you extubate the baby back to the NIV. Clear. So the insure, that means intubation, surfactant given extubation, Lisa, it's you place baby on the CBAB, you just have the angiocatheter or the Lisa catheter. You, while the baby still having CBAB, you don't block the entire airway, you pass the catheter, you give surfactant, you pull it out, and baby is never intubated. And although the procedure is similar, but you never big the, place the big endotracheal tube, which is blocked the entire airway. Hopefully, this is clear. That's a summary of the, uh, all the topics that we already covered the preventive measurement, uh, and you can see uh, all of them. It's the um, favorite of that in intervention. And here you can see the variable, these four trials, uh, three trials, nine trials, 17 trials, and you can guys look at uh, separate. If you have already baby on mechanical ventilation, you did the parameters that's supposed to be from the lung standpoint. You place baby on an IV, he's, he get worse, you, you intubate the baby, your baby stuck on the mechanical ventilation, there's no, no way to extubate the baby, you try, failed. When the baby reach, so he's less than 32 weeks, we said to call bronchopulmonary dysplasia, you have to wait until corrected 36 weeks. So around four weeks of age, Around four weeks of age, then you can look at the strategy of how can I treat. I know it's already baby lung already damaged, start damaged, already start having the Crohn pulmonary dysplasia changes or the PIE changes, which is the pulmonary emphysema, and baby going toward the chronic lung disease if he's not yet 36 weeks, then you have to use the new parameters or the new strategy. The lung in the first image, as you can see, it has heterogeneity. It has multiple components, atelectasis. You can see the black dots here, the BIE, hyper expansion. So you have the multiple zones. They called two compartment models. In this stage of the lung, if you have it, you rather use the strategy of the large tidal volume, and that's we discussed in mechanical ventilation for who's the new, just uh, joined us today. Uh, my recommendation to go to the mechanical ventilation and listen to that time constant, and based why we give tidal volume with short rate, slow rate, and longer eye time. So this strategy we said, we need to give larger tidal volume, with the short rate, adequate beep to open the alveoli and adequate pressure support. Most of the babies at the beginning, depending on the which center you trained, either you use assistant control or SIMV, there's a recommendation, assistant control over SIMV early, but when the baby late, SIMV work better than assistant control later when baby's chronic lung. So at this time, and we discussed last time that time constant equal to resistance multiply compliance. In chronic lung disease, the main issue with the baby what? Is that we said the resistance. The resistance is very high. 
So the time constant, what happened? It's gonna be high. So that's time. And how many time constant you need? Five time constant. What's the time constant? Is the amount of air come in or air come out? What's the time needed for all air to come out? So if you have baby chronic lung disease, according to this equation, you need higher time, longer time. So that's why the I time is longer, 0.5 to 0.8. And those longer I time, you need to provide larger tidal volume. And the recommendation to start 8 to 12, ML per kg of the tidal volume. The rate is very low, so at least to give time for the air trapping to get out. And that's the strategy we used for that. Is it all babies gonna like this strategy? No. If you have a baby chronic lung disease, but looks like more homogeneous, it looks like one component models, then you rather use it as a RDS strategy, which is that the smaller tidal volume, five to eight, shorter eye time, faster rate. And of course, adequate beep and adequate pressure support. Okay. Also, when you treat baby on mechanical ventilation, you allow permissive hypercabinia, which is again, I left it here so it's, it's clear, defined BCO2 50 to 55. The reason why we allow baby to be a little bit on the high side, so the, B, the B, BCO2 normal, 35 to 45. We allow the baby to tolerate a little bit higher BCO2 so we don't have to go up on the tidal volume. And that's called gentle mode or gentle strategic way. The same way when we discuss about bronchopulmonary, uh, uh, about the idiopathic pulmonary hypertension. So we allow those tiny baby to tolerate a little bit higher BC2 as long as the BH remain more than seven point. As long as your BH more than or equal to 7.25, you're good. So you leave the baby early with slightly hypercabinia, the BCO2 50 to 55. Okay? Also, so that's the respiratory. So we finished the respiratory component of the management of the baby. And then, the strategy, in if once you place the baby on mechanical ventilation, when you have those baby, you rather go very slow on monitor. You avoid all the stress around the baby. You don't need to stick the baby every day to just twice a day or three times a day just for the blood gas. Some center they do just once a week. Some center they do twice a week. So you you want to eliminate sticking the baby, stress out the baby. You want to provide the good environment for the baby. So usually when you deal with bronchopulmonary dysplasia, it's multi-task approach. It's not just lung and that's it. It's all about the package. Part of that package, you have the nutrition. The nutrition is very, very, very important component to, for those established bronchopulmonary dysplasia. It's very important to have the dietitian round with you and uh, at least once a week, if it's not every day, to give the input about the baby's growth, about baby nutrition, what he's taking. Because we know the baby is using a lot of energy, he loses a lot. So you need to maximize the energy. So the number one, we need to deliver adequate nutrition. Promote grow, growth state and achieve the proportional growth. Ideal weight for length, target is the 50%. We discussed a little bit about fluid. We said about the fluid, and before we continue about the nutrition, in the beginning, when you manage the baby, the first five, six days of life, baby sometimes have in your face, so you need to go up in the fluid. But the moment that the baby stop in your then you need to cut your fluid down. 
So the recommendation after first week of live, typically restrict your fluid. If you have baby with RD, especially if you expect that baby have, will develop bronchopulmonary diseases. So it's not for all babies. Those for babies who expected to have or at high risk for bronchopulmonary disease, and that's why we do the projection at the beginning. We look at what's the risk my baby might develop bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Once you pass the first week, baby is not in a neurotic phase, you need to cut your fluid down. You make him neutral or slightly negative fluid balance. Although there is indirect data supporting moderate fluid, balance, there's no clear evidence, but that's most of the places they recommend it. When you restrict your fluid, you improve the pulmonary function by preventing excessive fluid, pulmonary fluid. Most of your babies, they will develop around, after a week, pulmonary edema because of the BDA, inflammations. So you need to cut your fluid down to improve your gas, air gas exchanges. Back to the nutrition. The re energy requirement for babies is very important every day to look at your fluid, how much I have to give calories, how much I have to give protein if your baby on the TBN. If the baby on full feed, usually around 10 days of life, baby become full feed or seven to 10 days, depending on the policies that or protocol that you guys use. But when the baby reach full feed, you need to manage very well. You need to look at your numbers. How many calories I need? If your baby at risk of the BBH, because you restrict your fluid, you need to go up on the calories. So the recommendation around 130 to 150 kilocalories. Normal babies, the recommendation, it's around 110 to 120. In, in baby at risk, usually you need higher, 130 to 150 kilocalorie per kg per day. Also, on the daily base, you need to look at your protein intake. And the recommendation from 3.5 to 4 gram per kg per day. And in order to achieve the calories or the, the energy and the protein, you need to fortify your mom's milk. Or if you use the formula, use premature formula, and then you need to fortify it. Here in the United States, we used human milk. That's, the, uh, the, that's always recommended everywhere. If we don't have mom's milk or in, in mom still not have enough sufficient milk to provide, or for any reasons, then we have a donor breast milk. And we start with small 20 calories until we wanna make sure baby first few days. When we reach certain, and every hospital has different policies, but when we, when we reach certain level or certain amount, around 60 to 80, then we have to go up fortified our milk to go up to the calories, 24 and then 26. Some centers, immediately 26, like 20 calories. And then when baby reach around 60 to 80 ml per kg, fortify human milk to the 26 calories. By the prolacta weans, or the prolacta, sorry. The prolacta is the mom's milk, the same, but just highly concentration of calories. If you don't have it, and unfortunately Libya, then you, uh, 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 we will discuss later on what you guys use, but Whenever you have, then you need to fortify the either mom's milk or formula uh, to get higher calories, to achieve the higher protein and higher calories. The goal every day in our centers, most of the centers in the United States, every day they measure the weight of the baby. And once a week, you measure the length and head circumference. The goal for weight gain, if you are dealing with premature baby, 15 to 20 gram per kg per day, if baby corrected, less than 37 weeks corrected. And then 20 to 30 gram after that per day. So premature versus chronic lung disease, we said, Babies premature have limited store intake, immature gut, so you need to be careful, slowly go up advancing the feet because the risk of necrotizing enterocolitis, metabolic disturbance, especially in the first week of life, and the calorie requirement around 110, 120 kilocalorie per kg per day. 
In babies bronchopulmonary dysplasia, we said the same three of the first three, 130 to 150. Unfortunate with the babies on bronchopulmonary because we restrict the fluid. So that's why you need to make sure that you maintain higher calorie. And that's another uh, issue. You restrict your fluid, but at the same time, high calorie. Babies also on chronic pulmonary, they have slower weight gain compared with the healthy control. Have a poor linear growth, poor bone mass. They are at risk of osteopenia of prematurity. And also they have reflux issue that make feeding more difficult. Protein we discussed. If your baby start oral, especially if he's an oral feed and he's getting condition worse, always think of the micro aspiration because the chronic respiratory insufficiency would increase work of bread, plus baby has swallow breath in coordination or dysfunction, put your baby at risk of micro aspiration. And micro aspiration increase the lung inflammation and airway injury, and in fact, cause further damage to your lung and pulmonary, bronchopulmonary dysplasia or chronic lung disease, getting worse, and baby may be severe hypoxemia, and then end up pulmonary hypertension, we discussed about persistent hypoxemia. Also, when you have baby chronic lung disease, he will develop episodic hypo or at risk of episodic hypoplasia, and that's increased pulmonary vasoconstrictions we discussed last week, and that's increased risk of the pulmonary hypertension. So what's the pharmacological that it's been used for uh, decades in treating bronchopulmonary dysplasia, are there is any evidence around those medications? So we discuss about uh, respiratory, we discuss about fluid, we discuss about um, the dietitian or the nutrition management component, and now the medication or pharmacological component. Diuretics. Diuretics, Lasix, commonly used, hydrochlorothiazide, spirolactone. Lasix is a stronger diuretic that used but if you are baby on the chronic use we rather have the baby on the hydrochlorothiazide some people they mix or they combine hydrochlorothiazide with the spirolactone spirolactone is weak spy, uh, potassium sparing it's weak diuretics but they they some places or some centers they add spirolactones to the hydrochlorothiazide for the potassium because the diuretic especially the Lasix or the, or the hydrochlorothiazide cause hypokalemia. So that's why they add the spirolactone. Is that recommended most of the places? The answer is no. Uh, a lot of places they start just hydrochlorothiazide if the baby need diuretics. The issue with the Lasix or the furosemide, it's kicking the calcium and cause nephrocalcinosis. In addition, can cause electrolyte imbalance and metabolic alkalosis, refractory metabolic alkalosis. Now with them, kicking the calcium, osteopenia and nephrocalcinosis, the calcium deposition in the kidney, nephrocalcinosis. That's when you have Lasix for a long time. Cause hypo, mainly hyponatremia or hypokalemia, electrolyte imbalance. Refractory metabolic alkalosis. Okay? That's why, at least in my center, we prefer to use, in my training and now, we prefer to use hydrochlorothiazide. Weaker than the Lasix. The purposes of the, those diuretics, because the lung, we said baby might have pulmonary edema, inflammations, fluid, the, the, theoretically, the diuretics improve the lung mechanics and oxygenation. And there's potential help for the decrease the extubation failure. Any evidence? We, there is no evidence that diuretics prevent chronic lung disease. Again, there is no evidence that diuretics prevent chronic lung disease. Then why we use it? 
some center we use it to improve the baby clinic, like the acute status. Hopefully it's clear. Beta agonist, bronchodilator, decrease the airway resistance and improve the VQ. There is limited data also. The limited randomized controlled data of efficacy or adverse effect of the beta agonist. There's no clear evidence that neither one of these preventing bronchopulmonary, but it's widely used in the United States. Inhaled steroids, bodasonite, or flovent later on. Steroids inhaler, the as we know, steroids anti-inflammatory decrease lung inflammation. And the idea of giving inhaler steroid to decrease airway edema or inflammation and reduce the risk of using systemic steroid. But again, there is no clear evidence and the number of the study they look at, it's low number of the patient in randomized controlled trials. So unclear efficiency and few data about adverse effect. What about the systemic steroids? We have two common systemic steroid use. We have dexamethasone and we have the hydrocortisone. The dexamethasone used to be routine in baby because there are studies look show that using dexamethasone or steroid systemic steroid decrease bronchopulmonary dysplasia. But that's no longer recommendation. In fact, they are against using steroid and only in very, very, very exceptions. Why? Because the most Cochrane trials using steroids, they found, and especially the last one, increased the risk of the cerebral palsy and the major neurosensory disability. We know the steroid is a magic drug, but after this study, it's the American Academy, they don't recommend use steroids, systemic steroids or dexamethasone as a routine because of the increased chance of the cerebral palsy. In addition, increased risk of the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, increased risk of the spontaneous bowel, perforation, SP, spontaneous bowel, perforation. So early, that means in the early, less than eight days of life, after birth, if you have high risk that baby develop bronchopulmonary dysplasia, no perinatal care, um, he's immediately on mechanical ventilation, required higher oxygen. The early dexamethasone decrease the risk of the bronchopulmonary dysplasia, facilitate early extubation, but no effect on the duration of hospitalization or the oxygen use. But because of the cerebral palsy and major neurosurgery, that's no longer recommendation. What's the recommendation? The recommendation you have to balance. Look at the risk versus the benefit. So what's my risk and what's my benefit? What we use, widely use in America, is something called DART protocol. It's a short dose for 10 days of the dexamethasone late to use usually around three to four weeks of age, low dose of the corticosteroid. In the baby who's remain on mechanical ventilation around three to four weeks of life and required more than 50% of oxygen, then you might use it because the study, they look only in the early and for short period of time, There is no evidence that short period of time cause neurodevelopmental or <clears throat> impairment or cerebral palsy. 
So the meta-analysis trial showed that initiation of dexamethasone after first week of life reduced bronchopneumonia, but carry short-term risk, blood sugar high, as we know, and hypertension. So as always, the recommendation, you sit with your patient. So let's assume I have a patient who's four weeks stuck on mechanical ventilation, required higher oxygen. Then I have to sit with my patient, say, hey, uh, that's what happened. Your baby already on more than 50%. Um, higher mechanical ventilation, there's high chance of the mortality. Uh, I'm going to try small dose steroid. You discuss the risk out of benefit. If the parents, they agree, then you can use the low dose of the dexamethasone. Recently, there is hydrocortisone trials, <clears throat> and they look at the hydrocortisone and cerebalsi. There is no evidence that hydrocortisone caused cerebalsi is not like that, especially even in early used <clears throat> in the first week of life. So there is nine trials evaluate the safety and efficiency of the hydrocortisone. One of them is the largest study. They compared 10 days low dose of hydrocortisone giving at the first 24 of life with the later on with the chronic lung disease or mortality and they found that yes the hydrocortisone decreased bronchopulmonary dyslexia and improved survival but further analysis of subgroup those uh, big studies they found that Two-fold increase the risk of the late onset sepsis, especially for those babies less than or around 24 to 25 week gestation. So using early steroid or hydrocortisone dose, twice increase the risk of sepsis. Also increase the risk of the gastrointestinal, the spontaneous bowel perforation. The hydrocortisone did not improve two years neurodevelopmental outcome, despite the reduction of the Dit or bronchopulmonary dysplasia, but does not cause. It's not like the dexamethasone. Okay? And that's we already discussed all. That's the all statistic. And uh, there is here combined, that's the something recently, they combined steroid with the surfactant. So if you're going to give surfactant alone, they combined and they give it together, surfactant, mix it with bodesonide or the steroid, inhaled steroid. And there's two small trials they give to the babies less than 1,500 gram who require mechanical ventilation and more than 50%. Randomized to the botosonide mixed with surfactant versus surfactant alone. And that study, it's promising. Okay? For decreasing bronchopulmonary dysplasia or death, but there is no significant difference in the neurodevelopmental outcome between the groups and those small trials still uh, required large multi-analysis study uh, to, compare, to compare the efficiency uh, and the risk. Also, if you guys have a chance to go to the um, conference, the neonatology conferences, there is a lot they are talking about um, mesenchymal stem cell either um, from the placenta or bone marrow, the intratracheal mesenchymal stem cell transplant. And that's the very, very, very promising. Uh, still in the trial phase, it's the an animal study proof that clear and improve the chronic lung. And um, I saw a couple of the uh, articles, I attend a couple of the conferences about the mesenchymal cell, uh, stem cell transplant, and that's the promising. And they use mesenchymal stem cells not only for the bronchopulmonary dysplasia, but they have a wide variety of the uh, use, even in the stroke, in adult and uh, IVH and pediatric age group. Uh, they have multiple use, either from the placenta or from the bone marrow. Um, so that's one of the promising and there's potential uh, benefit. And hopefully um, we will see it uh, soon, but still on the phase one trial. And we have a limited of the preliminary result on the human. Okay, the outcome of bronchopulmonary dysplasia, as we know, the mortality of the severe chronic lung disease around 20 to 40 percent. Um, the morbidity from chronic lung disease, a baby uh, who has chronic lung disease at risk of the 
um, obstructive airway disease, asthma-like symptoms later on, recurrent pneumonia, recurrent infection. The most common infection is the respiratory syncytial virus. Uh, and that's why all premature babies, not all chronic lung disease baby, not premature, less than 29 weeks, or the chronic lung disease, usually we give the respiratory syncytial virus uh, vaccine um, during the season. Um, babies, those babies, chronic lung disease, they are repeated hospitalization for different cause. They are at risk of the neurodevelopmental abnormality. Uh, they are at risk of the pulmonary hypertension. That's why some centers, some center of the policy they do, uh, we uh, monthly echo to look for the pulmonary hypertension. Uh, some center only if the baby severe hypoxemia, they do uh, echo to look for the pulmonary hypertension. Uh, those babies, chronic lung disease, they, because of the tube, long time, uh, intubated for long time, they are at risk of the tracheal stenosis or um, laryngeal or tracheomalacia or laryngeal, uh, mainly tracheomalacia or the stenosis. Uh, they are at risk of the uh, G-tube dependent because of the neurodevelopmental environment and they might send home or go home on the G-tube. So there is potential risk the parents they have to know when you are dealing with resuscitating the 22 uh, or 23 weeks uh, gestation. Uh, in the United States, um, uh, most of the center they they offer or they discuss about viability, uh, whether we're going to do resuscitation for less than 32 weeks, some center 22, uh, but majority is the 24, the resuscitate, 22, 23, they discuss with the parents and depend on the reliability or depend on what they are thinking based on the outcomes. If they agree to go ahead, then they receive steroids and uh, we go ahead and resuscitate the baby. Uh, so in the summary, the prevention, prevention, prevention is the key. Um, to minimize the lung injury and prevent bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Uh, start as the antenatal, uh, during the perinatal period by providing steroids, correcting the risk factors. Um, if the baby is uh, born, make sure the mom should receive steroids, a betamethasone and um, um, magnesium sulfate as a neuroprotection. Um, baby immediately, CBAB, uh, if you are center use the uh, LISA or um, uh, MIST, uh, early surfactant administration, if they are insured, uh, use surfactant as a rescue mode. Um, <clears throat> caffeine, vitamin A, the only medication uh, that has quality of evidence support uh, using for bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Rotili in the United States, all babies on the caffeine, uh, who is less than 32 week gestation. Vitamin K, some center they use it, some center no, because just now they came back on the market. Uh, the center that they didn't use it, they didn't see uh, huge changes since they stopped the vitamin A. Dexamethasone, you need to be careful twice, uh, think twice before you consider. Yes, uh, the effective therapy, very effective therapy, uh, but uh, adverse effect, large adverse effect. So you can outweigh benefit uh, with the risk. Uh, hydrocortisone as an alternative option, but um, you need to discuss about uh, risk of the sepsis and uh, there's always risk of any steroids, risk of the um, spotinous bowel perforation. Um, and uh, um, I'm ending uh, my story with uh, this uh, boy. Uh, he's 23 weeker, uh, born my, when I just joined uh, Mercy Health or Jovan Bay Hospital. Uh, at the time I was, uh, I think, uh, one month as a neonatologist. Um, he was very severe. Um, um, he's around uh, 400 something grams. Uh, with uh, no perinatal care. Um, actually, there's perinatal care, but the mom, she did not receive steroid or only one dose, if I'm not wrong. Baby would, was severe hypoxemic. And at the time I used a new mode of ventilation because he was severe hypoxemia. Uh, the ventilation mode called ABRV. Um, at the time, everyone in the hospital, they are against because, uh, or at least the director and the people in the, um, but the baby uh, thankfully survived. He went home on the nasal cannula with the G-tube. And in the right side, you can see, um, uh, or in the left side, you can see his pictures um, smiling and he's doing much better. He still have some uh, mild, um, uh, or he's behind in his uh, development or motor skills, but uh, he's, he's there and he's going and you can see he has a beautiful smile. And uh, thank you very much. I'm gonna see if anyone has a uh, questions. Let's 
see. Yes. Um, I can see the first question. Hydrocortisone can be given in the first few days of life, yes. Uh, but you need to, uh, as I said, there is high risk of the um, um, sepsis, uh, bronco, uh, spontaneous bowel perforation, but yes, you can use it. Um, that's the trials, um, and there is big trials. It's not even small trial. Uh, looking at the hydrocortisone in preventing bronchopulmonary dysplasia, and the hydrocortisone link that is not that does not decrease the um, thrombosis, but also does not improve the neurodevelopmental outcome as well. Uh, this one, uh, aminophylline, uh, we discussed this one uh, on the RDS. Uh, aminophylline no longer used in the United States uh, because we have caffeine, but if you are in the place uh, you don't have caffeine, um, uh, I think you can use it, but you need to be careful about the risk of aminophylline. Does in, whether the uh, same rule of caffeine management of the BBD, uh, decrease BBD, that's, I don't think there's any study, I'm not aware of, uh, but uh, any of audience, if he has any evidence that aminophylline uh, reduce the risk of bronchopulmonary dysplasia, that's, I'm not aware. Um, and um, yeah, I don't know. But for the apnea of prematurity, yes. For bronchopulmonary disease, I don't have any evidence because uh, no longer used uh, outside uh, Libya uh, or those um, countries that they don't have facilities because most of centers they use the the dose I, uh, for vitamin D. I don't know, Doctor uh, uh, Faisal. Do you have vitamin? Do you guys give vitamin A? Uh, yes, we do. What's the dose? I believe it's 5,000, but I can uh, double check to be honest. I, I forgot yeah, the dose. My, but... in, my, in my center, even my training, uh, we don't uh, give vitamin A because of nationwide shortage. And now uh, when uh, came back the vitamin A, uh, when came back in the in place, uh, we did not use it because uh, as I said, uh, a lot of places they don't use it because they didn't see the benefit, but doesn't mean that uh, it's recommended to use it if you have it. The issue with vitamin A, the only issue that I see in vitamin A, uh, uh, it's the in intramuscular. Uh, there is intral used in Europe, uh, intral vitamin A. Um, here in under trials, uh, I don't uh, have the, we don't have clear evidence of the oral or intral, but it's used in Europe. That's what I know. With the so yes yeah, so you those babies discharge home with this uh, beta metazone and the steroid yes you're gonna send them home as a asthma patient yes you we send them home on the if baby is not all BBD so if baby um, discharge home on room air then you don't need uh, uh, albuterol uh, steroids you can prescribe it as an outpatient in case uh, or you can just leave him on the steroid but uh, usually usually I send baby home. If they are on nasal cannula or any kind of respiratory support, usually we send home baby. Uh, the criteria to send baby home, usually um, if the baby less than uh, one liter uh, nasal cannula, uh, at the time there is tank, so you can have the parents, they can manage. Uh, if we just, if baby required and stuck in the hospital required higher than uh, one liter or one liter and higher than usually the transition unit, uh, we don't send them home on that. Uh, so transition unit until uh, baby improve. Uh, but uh, if the baby required any respiratory support, the answer is yes. Um, and I, again, uh, there is no evidence. There's wide practice, variation in practice from one center to another. When we stop caffeine, uh, usually we stop caffeine uh, around 34 week gestation, corrected, yes. Uh, you can leave him la later, yes. Um, th that's the variation. Uh, recommendation majority around 34. Some people, they leave it uh, later, but let's assume that you stop at around 34 and baby start having the apnea of prematurity symptoms, then you can continue. Um, what a differentiation that's crossing your mind when you look at the X-ray, uh, which is X-ray. Um, the, because the X-ray that I show, uh, both the X-rays that I show, it's the, the first X-ray that I show, the old PBD, that's the, um, the old one, you're not gonna see it in the baby who just born. Uh, that's typical for chronic lung disease uh, X-ray image. Uh, but the second homogenous, when you see it, you think of the sepsis or you think of the species GBS sepsis or the RDS. So ground glass appearance uh, or hyaline disease membrane on the X-ray, like white homogenous white out. Usually you see it on the baby with RDS or uh, GBS um, pneumonia.
Uh, two people raised their hands. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Um, Dr. Salah. How we could fortify mom milk in Libya? Uh, I'm not sure in Libya what you guys have, so uh, it's hard to answer. Yeah, it's hard to answer what you guys have. Huh? I don't think there's any HMF in Libya. Human milk for if it's halal. If you have a human milk fortified, then you can use the human milk fortified uh, to increase. To increase calories, uh, but it's very important that uh, each center has to adopt its feeding protocol, and, uh, um, and the feeding protocol is very important. Uh, um, so uh, slow but steady increase on the feed. That's the key. Um, the fortification usually around the bent. Uh, what you can use, whether you use the breast milk uh, brolacta, a fortified with brolacta or HMF. So it's each each play. Each one has a different uh, policy when you fortify, but average usually around four uh, sixty to eighty uh, ml per kg. Are you guys uh, Faisal? Do you use uh, uh, brolacta or uh, HMF? Yeah, we use prolactin. I mean, there is like um, like a policy. We use uh, get, um, prolactin like, for less than 32 weeks. Second one, what about immune prophylaxis of respiratory science tissue? I'm not sure. 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 I'm not and the second one about the immune prophylaxis of respiratory sanctitial virus to reduce the morbidity in infant with bronchopulmonary dysplasia. In terms of premature, any premature baby less than 29 weeks gestation, well, uh, there is policy, okay, and there is criteria who will get the. أمريكا تختلف طبعا كل بلا كل بلاد وعندها بوليسي تختلف حتى في أمريكا هنا الأمريكا كان بدياتريك على المانيفاكتشر there is difference لأن insurance who's will be who's يعني في اختلافات فالمانيفاكتشرز المفروض كل البريماتيور بيبي ما تخش مني الناس بالضبط الكريتيريا لكن احنا عندنا الكريتيريا في المستشفى اللي هو تابع للA B recommendation less than 29 week as corrected ولا baby with chronic lung disease أي baby أو إن كان عندك كارديك بيبي يكون جيت الهارت ديزيز يعني في سيرتين كريتيريا تو انفولف ذا سكند إنك أنت مش أي وقت تعطيها الآر اس في اميونايزيشن تعطيها وقت تبدا عندك السيزون فتعتمد عليه السيزون في العادة في العادة السيزون تبدا مع أوغست تستمر لمارش أو أبريل ذيس يير تل أبريل ولا حتى شو اسمه إيه تل أبريل فعلا لا ومحتال يبدا شنو يبدو المانج ال في سيرتين كريتيريا بالنسبه للسيتي اللي انت اللي احنا فيها مثلا في هنا في الينوي يبدا يقول لك الاير اللي انت فيها عندك مثلا النمبر اوف كيسز اوف ار اس في ستيل عندهم ميجرمنت اذا كان باز ذا ميجرمنت ذن يو ستيل كونتينيو تو جيف ذا ار اس في انتل ذيس نمبر جو داون فهي اعتمادات يعتمد بالنسبه لليبيا طبعا ما عندناش شو اسمها يعني يما يما الجفرمنت سبورت فانا له ولا البارنتس ذير اون اكسبنسز معناتها البريماتيور بيبي دي ويل جيت بينيفيت لوك ات ذا مانيفاكتشر جايد لاينز وفولو ذا جايد لاينز يعني ما نذكرش تو في لان ما نستعملوش فيها الجايد لاينز بتاعهم لكن يو كان لوك ات ذا جايد لاينز بالنسبه للانفلونزا والاذر فاكسينيشن تعطى كان نورمال بيبي يعني مع البوست يعني بيبي وين هيز تو مانث اوف ايج We need to give him the immunization. Whenever the protocol that you guys have for the immunization record uh, for Libyan immunization, نفس الفكرة. بالنسبة لل influenza vaccine يكون as outpatient يا ينعطى. لكن inpatient ما نعطوش فيه. طبعا ال inpatient في النكيو ما دام البيبي النكيو ال immunization الوحيدة ما تنعطاش اللي هو ال live attenuated vaccine. تعطي ال killed vaccine ال killed vaccine وال uh, وال اسمه. الكيلد فاكسين والبولي ساكرايت فاكسين لكن الـ لكن اللايف ايه اللايف تريت فاكسين ما تقدرش تعطيه فهذه اذا كانت تعطوا في الاورال بوليو ما تقدرش تعطيه الاورال بوليو أه. يعني عشان الروتا فايروس انتم اللي عندكم لا المهم الفاكسينز اللي عندكم لايف تريت فاكسين هذه ما تقدرش تعطيها في النكيو وايل بيبي عند النكيو 
وانس ذا بيبي ديشارجد هوم زي الروتين جو تو ذا روتين يعني شوفي قديش عمره ولا شو اسمه اذا كان هو مثلا سنه او الايت مانث بتعطيه تطعيمات ثمانيه شهور وهكذا شكرا دكتور ادرينالين نيبولايزر والله ما سمعتش بها الادرينالين نيبولايزر رول اوف ادرينالين نيبولايزر ما عرفش دكتور فيصل كان عندك انا ما سمع اي نيفر ايفن هيرد اباوت ادرينالين نيبولايزر اللي هو اي نيفر ميبي شي از توكينج اباوت ريسيميك اي بي ناتش اذا كان تقصدي بالريسيميك تقصدي بالريسيميك اي بي الريسيميك اي بي نفرين فدلا نعطوا فيهم اذا كان عنده اير واي ايديما يعني شو معناتها اذا كان البيبي اكستيبيت وصار له سترايدر أم وبيبي نعرفه من الهيستوري انه ما خداش أه اللي هو ستيرويد في العاده الدكساميتازون سمول تايني دوز وي جيف 3 دوزز اذا كان البيبي انتيوبيتد فور لونج تايم وي نو ان انت وينس وانس يو بول ذا تيوب اوت هي مايت بي ات ريسك اوف ذا اير واي ديما ذن ذير از بروتوكول فور ذا دكساميتازون 3 دوزز تايني دوز 0.3 اور 0.25 And the for three doses, uh, two doses prior, one after uh, extubation. If the canal baby uh, he did not get, or if baby developed strider um, and you don't know what's going on, why he has a strider structure all of a sudden, then you can try racemic epinephrine. If the canal had a hemostatic. Rule of the chest physiotherapy: Yes, you can do the chest physiotherapy if you have the. Shani, if the canal had the pneumonia, or if the canal had the secretions that's hard to get out. Yes. We, we do the chest physiotherapy. Uh, did I miss any questions? Mm. We use also, I mean, uh, prednisolone uh, oral. Hey, prednisolone oral we used. So prednisolone, I did not discuss, uh, sorry. The prednisolone, uh, we used oral for those um, late, very late, and uh, to take him away from the, let's assume the baby full feed and, um, So the early dexamethasone or the hydrocortisone, because the baby already has the central line. Later on, if you want to take your baby away, some centers, and in my center too, we involve the pulmonologist. You don't have to, but we involve them. We use the prednisolone short. Some babies, they go home and prednisolone. They like asthma. When you have asthma, he has airway obstruction, like the severe stats asthmaticus. Usually we send them home of the uh, oral prednisolone for a short period of time. Uh, some babies, they, uh, they respond very well. Some baby, no. Some baby, they just get a few short course. Some baby, they need longer. Lacking, uh, who are recommended? No. Have any evidence? No. Lacking, people use it. Yes. I mean, what was the explanation for? Uh, sorry. Uh, very, very important. In, before you give any steroid, especially the uh, oral prednisolone um, or the long course steroids, always think of the osteopenia of prematurity. Grot, the uh, steroid, has uh, also a side effect. For the, for the hypertension, for the, we talked about them, the high blood pressure, high blood sugar. Steroid can cause osteopenia of prematurity, can affect in growth. Fainta uh, already premature baby, he's at risk of the osteopenia of prematurity, at risk of the uh, growth uh, restrictions. Fainta think twice, weigh benefit, risk versus benefit. the baby already stuck on the respiratory support, you don't have any options. If you think the benefit way uh, higher than the risk, then yes, you can use it. Uh, no, no, the, I was just trying to add uh, like a few comments regarding the permissive hypercapnia, the rationale for permissive hypercapnia. Okay. Um, the permissive hypercapnia, so, so, the national ideal اللي هي اخذوها منين؟ من كولومبيا uh, هوسبيتال، اوكي؟ okay. لقوا ان كولومبيا عندها هوسبيتال عندهم لور كرونيك لانج ديزيز. ولما شافوا المانجمنت استراتيجي اوف ذا اوف ذات بليس دي فاوند ذا بيبي ليست لايكلي تو بي انفولفد اون ميكانيكال فنتيليشن اند فور ذيم ذي ادابت بيرميسيف هايبر كابنيا يعني الهاير سي او 2 باش تو افويد انتيوبيت ذا بيبي يعني احنا واحده من الانديكيشن تو انتيوبيت ذا بيبي انه هو البيبي عنده ريسبيرتوري اسيدوزز ولا عنده هاير سي او 2 
فهم لا ماي ماي دي دونت انكيبيت ذا بيبي لانك انت الجول بتاعك انك تو ليف ذا بيبي اون ذا نان انفيزيف از ماتش از يو كان هذه نمبر 1 انك انت تو افويد انكيبيشن لكن وانس ان ذا بيبي انكيبيتد يو دونت وانا لايك اوكي ان سي او 2 از 60 اي ام نوت غانا جو اب ليت مي جو اب اون ذا فينس سو هاير يو جو اب اون ذا فينس بريشر اور ذا تايدل فوليوم مور يو كرييت فوليو تروما اور بار تروما فانت فذاتس واي دي وونت us to wean faster so you you tolerate a little bit higher uh, bco2 in order for us for you to wean المشكلة, higher than hypercabinia hypocabinia increase the risk of the periventricular leukomalacia لان بينقص cerebral blood flow وهذا they cause ischemia ودي لك leukomalacia الhypercabinia increase blood flow لكن انت يضمن وانا بي سوبر هاي يعني انت قال لك البروتوكول ذير از نو كلير نمبر واتس ذا بيست نمبر فور بيبيز لكن موست اوف ذا بليسز ذي ريكومند اراوند 50 تو 55 نورمال اراوند 5.35 تو 45 انت بتعطيه علشان يلا 55 45 تو 55 اتس اوكي از لونج از يور بي اتش از نوت سوبر لو ميك سنس Any other question? Any question? Uh, mute, لو سمحت المايك. أي سؤال قبل أي سؤال؟ ما عادش في اسئله خلاص؟ في واحد كذب شكرا خلاص اوكي جزاكم الله خيرا سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك لا اله الا انت استغفرك واتوب اليك آه فيصل آه ريكورد الفيديو له اوكي جزاكم الله خيرا السلام عليكم